Alright, here we go. Back at it again for another edition of Knicks Fan TV Live presented by Manscaped. Another edition of the NBA Draft Q&A where you have the questions. We bring you the experts who have the answers. Tonight's guest returning to the show, our guy Rafael Barlow of the NBA Draft Big Board. He's ready to go. He's ready for the smoke. We got mock drafts for you guys. We got a couple of uh, Knicks news, some some workouts that we want to talk about today. So lock in, hit that thumbs up button for you boys. CP the franchise in the building. Alex Rotaros on the other side. Salute to Knicks Nation once again. Salute to everybody in the chat. Good to be back. And let's kick things off. All right, man. Back at it again. Today is June 6th. We are just about uh, two weeks, two and a half weeks out from the 2022 NBA Draft. Knicks holding the number 11 pick and the number 42 pick in the NBA Draft. So we're going to get into it, talk about uh, some of your favorite prospects. If you guys have particular prospects that you want to talk about outside of our program, call us up 657 383 one five zero nine, or hit us up on the Knicks Fan TV Discord. But before we get into that, man, I gotta say what's good to my guy Rafael Barlow returning to the show. Been a busy, busy man, Rafael. How you feeling, man? Welcome back, bro. Man, I'm good, man. Thanks for having me on. I um, I remember the first time I was on, I left my dishwasher open. It was deep, <laughs> so I had to make sure that that uh. That's not the case today. <laughs> yeah, man. The dishwasher was going crazy the whole episode, but that's how it goes down, man. Um, catch us up on, on some of the highlights of the last year. Like I said, man, you, you had a lot of wins. It's been a busy year for you. Uh, just sum it all up for us. Yeah, it's been a crazy, crazy 12 months. It's I'd say it started off when I did the live draft show on the Locked On Network with Chad Ford. And um, maybe a few weeks after that, I got engaged. Then a few weeks after that, I got married, moved to to Europe for the basketball season, lived in Barcelona, lived in, uh, I mean, Knicks fans will probably want to hear a little bit about my Barcelona experiences because you got a got a player over there. Absolutely. Um, Lived in uh, Athens for a little bit, spent some time in Italy, Uh, went to Paris a few times. Then I uh, found out my wife was pregnant, so I got a little one on the way coming <laughs> at the end of the summer. And then uh, Chad Ford retired, and, and Chad left me his uh, NBA Big Board newsletter and podcast. So that's kind of – I mean, that kind of sums it up, man. It's, it's been like a blessed 12 months. I can't even – I can't even lie, man. It's kind of surreal in a yeah. sense. And and, uh, and, I, and I feel like you can probably relate. I mean, I've just seen how things have progressed for you. We, we met, what, two years ago, and I just seeing how things have taken off. So it's definitely a blessing. Man, congratulations on all of that. It, it, it's well-deserved, man, because, you know, when I was scouting on YouTube and I came across your videos, you know, I, I saw somebody in yourself who was, you know, I saw the passion. I, I saw the, the, the sharp analysis. I saw your dedication to it. Uh, you were traveling back then. And, and, and your videos back then, I was like, you know, this is a guy that I want to bring on and, and, you know, share his knowledge with the fans on prospects, man. So to see where you were and to see where you are now and, and where you're going, because the journey continues, I, I think it's a great thing. And, and the great thing about YouTube and, and establishing yourself as a content creator is that you can see the journey in its increments. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Little by yeah. little, the buildups, the come ups, you could see all of that unfold step by step. So I think that's a beautiful thing, man. Congratulations once again. Um, you, you mentioned Barcelona. Let's, let's talk about Barcelona. We we got Rokas Yakubaitis over there. What what were your uh, early impressions of Rokas? I mean, I've liked him since day one. My first time seeing him was people may not remember, but when Lamelo Ball and the Ball family were playing in Lithuania. One of their games on Facebook Live was against Yoko Baitis. And mm. I think Yoko Baitis had like 31 points that game. So ever since then, I have kind of been keeping track of him. Then a few years later, I lived in, um, I saw him play live in Istanbul once. So mm. I've been keeping track of him. So um, this is my first time seeing him live since maybe like 2017-ish or something like that. So I had a chance to, I probably went to about 10 of his games. Played very well. I thought that, I mean, 
I just thought he looked good. Mm. And the, the biggest difference between European basketball and NBA basketball is that there's no draft in, in, in Europe. So there's no reward for losing. So if you are playing, then that means you've earned your spot. I mean, he, he did get pushed into the starting role because of an injury, but the games are really competitive. There's no, I mean, there are bad teams, but even the bad teams in Europe are trying not to get demoted to the second division. So the games are, are really intense. It's an older league. You don't really see a lot of young players playing and he more than held his own and Barcelona was one of the the best teams. They went to the Final Four. They were mm-hmm. one of the best teams all year, and and he was able to hold it down. So I thought he played really, really well. Uh, that's good, and and I think you know Knicks fans are kind of anxious to see him up here with the big club. He did mention that he's going to probably stay there, but I think that's the best bet for him. You know, given given where this team is right now, clearly, uh, I I don't think they want you know someone who they, they're going to have to you know, throw into the fire. They want somebody who's going to be, who's going to be ready, but it's, he seems like a kid that's going to need a little bit more development. So it's probably better off that he stays out there rather than, you know, coming to the Knicks and his playing time, not really be guaranteed. Yeah. I mean, to me, honestly, if you've been to Barcelona, then you understand why it doesn't make any sense for Mm. him to come over. It's a great city. I compare it to like Paris and Santa Monica, LA at Mm. the same time. Mm. I mean, it's it's just a great place. He's playing, he's playing a lot of minutes there, and uh, it just you know it would be tough for him to to leave, especially if the Knicks aren't going to guarantee him any right. minutes. And realistically, it just it just doesn't make sense for him at all to come over. Yeah. Ah, we'll, we'll have to wait and see, man. But so far, you're certainly making a good impression over there in Barcelona, so we'll, we'll certainly be keeping tabs. Now, let's get to your debut on the NBA Big Board, your first mock mm-hmm. draft. Now, you had the, at number 11, you had the Knicks taking Mark Williams out of Duke. What did you think about that yeah. pick? Yeah, I mean, not the sexiest pick. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I don't think... Uh, I mean, well, I put it like this. If if Mitchell Robinson leaves in free agency, mm-hmm. Williams is a cheaper replacement. And I think that he has a – I don't think he's as talented as Mitchell Robinson, but I think he has a higher upside. I think he'll be able to play in more games. <laughs> and and mm-hmm. I think you can actually – maybe not in the playoffs. I think in the playoffs he may get – you know, kind of ran off the floor, but I do think you can play him and feel comfortable late in games because he's a much better free throw shooter. Mm. I think he has a more understanding of his role and what he's supposed to do. And I just think he's probably a little bit more, more reliable. So if you can, if if Mitchell Robinson is going to command anywhere from 13 to $15 million a year, you can get Mark Williams cheaper Mm. and have him under contract for, for a few more years. Again, I'm not the sexiest pick and I mean, it can change, but if they're, if, if they're looking for a, a young center that they can get on a cheap, that can anchor a defense. then I think it makes sense. What was Williams? Did he participate in the combine? No, no. Oh, okay. He measured well, nine mm-hmm. foot nine standing reach. Mm-hmm. Uh, he did his pro day there. Uh, just a massive human being. And so, uh, but no, I mean, 40 out of my top 60 guys that I have rated did not actually play at the combine. Interesting. Hmm. In- interesting indeed. Um, and then, you know, the other big that that's been mentioned in this lottery is, uh, is Jalen Duren. H- how do you see uh, uh, Williams versus Duren? How do you see those two guys stacking up against each other? Well, I tweeted that, and it was from a scout that said, obviously, Duran is probably going to go higher in the draft. But if they had a workout one-to-one, he thought Mark Williams would get would get the best of them. And the reason why Duran is a little higher, because he's one of the youngest players in the draft, only 18 years old, is thought to have a higher upside, even though Williams is only, I guess, a year older in experience. But Duran was, I mean, he's supposed to be a high school senior right now. And, and um, he reclassified up a little early. Um, but yeah, this scout felt like you know in a head-to-head matchup or in a workout, Duran would would uh, wouldn't look as good as Mark Williams. But then Knicks fans let me know about Kevin Knox and that whole story. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mention the workouts <laughs> with the Knicks fans. So, Don't mention the workouts. Well, Knicks fans are very knowledgeable. You can't let anything slide nah. by 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 Knicks fans. And so so of course people were 
on my head talking about who cares about a head to head matchup, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I understand their point of view, but if we're not going to make, if, if the matchups aren't going to hold any weight, then why hold them? Right, right. Yeah, it's fair. I, I mean, listen, uh, you know, I, I get Knicks fans are kind of burned by the, by the Knox thing, but it just, it is what it is. Um, Al, anything on, on the centers before we go to the second round mock? Yeah, I, I guess. Raphael, did you choose Mark Williams because of the thought of Mitchell Robinson just leaving? Or did you think he's like, for that talent, the best player available when the time comes? Strictly because of Mitchell Robinson possibly leaving. Mm. So it was okay. some. So, that, right, so before I took over for Chad Ford, it was all my opinion, right? I didn't have the intel and in, in the, you know, just the resources. I mean, I had a few people, but mm. now since Chad had made a name for himself by using Intel and resources, of course, in order to keep that section of the, the subscribers happy, I was, you know, trying to gather as much Intel that I could at the combine. And it sounded like um, people expect Mitchell Robinson to leave or the Knicks probably have a limit. All right. We're not mm-hmm, going over mm-hmm. this amount of money. If he gets this offer, fine, we'll, we'll let him go. And so, um, just based off of what I heard and based off what people are assuming and thinking, they think that um, he'll get more than what the Knicks are willing to pay, which means New York would probably be in the market for a young starting center that can be a defensive anchor. Okay. Now we know about uh, Williams' like strength on the defensive end. Do you think there's high potential for him on the offensive side of the ball? Because right now for the Knicks, right, we look at Mitch as just being a lob threat and – you know, some fans are looking for the center, especially Mitch, to do a little bit more than just being a lot of it. So do you think he can get, like, back to the basket type of game, like a short mid-range type of game going? Because he did take a few jumpers through his college career. Not a lot, not a lot, not a large sample size. But do you think there's any upside towards that aspect of his game? I think a little. I just think it would depend on if the coach is going to give him the green light to shoot those shots. The free throw percentage is encouraging. Mm. And, um, you know, if you're one of those people that believes free throw shooting or free throw percentage is an indicator of shooting touch, mm. then yes, it is encouraging. I think best case scenario, he may be able to knock down short corner jumpers, maybe at the elbow, maybe at the free throw line. I don't see it coming right away. But then again, you just never know. Maybe he had it in his game and he just wasn't really able to showcase it in college because, you know, college isn't all about developing guys. It's about, you know, they're trying to win. <laughs> Wow, the NBA is more so about developing because you 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 have a little bit of time depending on your your situation. But I wouldn't be shocked if he becomes a reliable shooter from 15 feet within the next three to four years. Mm. Okay, and for like Jalen Duran, like what's the what would you say would be the case to take Duran instead of Mark Williams if the Knicks were to go in that direction and take it a center? Yeah, he's younger. Um, obviously, he's a couple years younger. I'd say he's more athletic, and he would probably be a better fit as far as being able to switch. I think Mark is going to be a, a drop coverage big. Hmm. Mark will be this anchor that will get your team to the playoffs, but you don't know how if you can use him in the playoffs because hmm. he might get ran off the floor. But I also feel that some centers – are getting ran off the floor. But I think if there's, if every team is switching, if you have the right point guard that knows how to feed them the ball when they have a mismatch and they can seal smaller players, then I think they can stay on the floor. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of, kind of nitpicking, but I felt like even last year in the finals with Chris Paul, it was like he was shooting the contested mid range pull up over Giannis, which he was making them, but, DeAndre Ayton had Drew Holiday on him on the seal Mm -hmm. and they preferred to have CP3 shooting the contested pull-up so and even with Utah I feel like there's times well we know in Utah their offense it doesn't matter Rudy Gobert could have me on him on a switch and Rudy's job is to get out the way and let Donovan iso against the big because they feel like he either gets a layup a foul or he can draw help and kick it out to someone that can knock down a corner three so with all that being said I do Mm -hmm. think that if Point guards fed centers the ball on duck ins or or on switches when they have guards on them, then they should be able to stay on the floor. But I guess analytically, people feel like the guard can create a better opportunity or better mismatch with the big. So 
the guards usually clear out <laughs> and, okay. and take the big. Now, now with, with the second round pick on the NBA draft big board, you selected J.D. Davison, point guard out of Alabama. Yeah. What, what's your thoughts on J.D.? So J.D. was a, I mean, I think at one point in the season, I had him as high as the lottery. And um, I mean, super talented kid, explosive athlete, big time scorer. Maybe not the purest point guard. I think that he is more so of a a scoring point than a natural point guard. And on one hand, I feel like going to Alabama showed that he wasn't afraid of competition. He could have went to a bunch of schools and been handed the keys to the offense. He chose to go to Alabama where they already had a point guard in place. He ended up coming off the bench. I mean, he played starter minutes. Um but it kind of hurt him in a sense is that he he uh, just didn't perform as well as many thought. Mm. And he, had, you know, he turns the ball over a lot. My biggest issue and disappointment with him is I felt like the combine was suited for him to show what he could do. Mm. He, I mean, he's uh, he signed with Mike Miller, the agent, Mike Miller's agency. Mm-hmm. I don't know if Mike is the official agent but none of their guys participated at the combine. Mm. And I mean, of course, you know, I mean, agents have, have the power and it wasn't just JD. Mm -hmm. Most players didn't participate in this, you know, their agents advised them not to. So in my opinion, I thought this is just my opinion, but I thought that if he plays at the combine, he could really help himself. I don't think his floor as far as the draft is secure enough to where you can say, all right, he's going to be a first round pick. Mm. So, um, Again, he didn't play at the combine, but I think he is. I mean, I I think he could end up being like an Eric Bledsoe type. Mm. I remember Bledsoe didn't start at college in in college behind John Wall, got to the Clippers, was playing behind Chris Paul, learned, and then a few years later he became a reliable point guard. And I think Davison could be that. I mean, a similar role. I don't think they play exact same, but just this freakishly explosive guard that should look good with NBA spacing. It's just a matter of can he cut down on the turnovers and the okay. can the decision making improve? Gotcha. Yeah, that's I was gonna ask. Where do you see uh, you know the holes in his game? I had to figure it, it was either decision making, is it defense? Uh, what do you think? Yeah, the decision making. I mean, I think he's if I'm not mistaken, he's from like a smaller area in Alabama yeah. where he just was by far the most gifted player, mm-hmm. and I, I mean, just had ridiculous high scoring games. And so he was able to dominate just off of his athleticism and skill. And then um, there's probably an adjustment to him trying to play point guard. And uh, But I do think that with NBA spacing, he will look good. He's someone that once he gets a – I mean, he can get to the paint and he can score. Like he had a really good game against Gonzaga earlier in the year. And then after that, he just was kind of inconsistent. But, you know, I think with the right development, he's a guy that can – easily easily outplay his draft position do you see someone like davison being on the nba roster once he gets drafted or do you see him going down to the julia getting some burn there and then working his way up it just depends on the team i think with this draft anywhere between maybe 15 possibly even 40 i don't think there's that big of a difference so let's say somebody selects jd davison at 17 i don't it wouldn't shock me if he falls to 42. It wouldn't shock me because it's such a crapshoot this year because you have a lot of guys that were projected as lottery picks, mid first round picks, and then they didn't have the freshman season that many anticipated. Mm. And so, I mean, in some cases, you got um, Peyton Watson from UCLA. He thought Johnny Juzang and Jamie Hawkins were going to leave after going to the Final Four. They came back, mm. and the coach wasn't going to play the freshman over his two leading scorers that got him to the final four. So he was stuck playing behind, um, you know, two upperclassmen. Um, I think Alabama's point guard, Javon Quinterly, I think that maybe JD thought he was going to leave for the draft. He ended up staying in school. So that put him in a situation where he wasn't um, the starter. So I think there's a few guys that kind of had disappointing freshman years, but could possibly, you know, maybe it's a situation could live up to the their preseason hype that they had, and so um, I think again, it, I think it's just going to depend on on the team and the fit. Okay, and then 
you know, reading on on Davidson, his jumper is a concern, right? He didn't really shoot that well. Do you do you expect him to make a turnaround? Because obviously, you, if he's going to be playing well or better in spacing, having a jumper is going to be key for for someone of, of his size. Yeah, and that's why I said he's more so of a scorer than shooter. I think he kind of needs volume. Hmm. And um, I'm trying to think of like the best example of a guy that's like a scorer than than a shooter. I mean, he can get hot and score points in bunches. But I think obviously he's going to need to improve because he may not have that role where he's going to have a high volume and, and, you know, get 20 shots a game like he was used to in high school. So I definitely think he's going to adjust. But he also seems like a guy that if you send him to the G League, then he's going to go back to how he played high school. He's going to put up big numbers there. And then once you call him up to the parent club, he's going to have to readjust to Mm. playing in a role. Um, but all it takes is one team to like him. And uh, again, he didn't play in the combine. So him or his agency must feel like they have a nice landing spot for him in the draft. We're talking to Raphael Barlow, NBA draft, big board. So to everybody in the chat, once again, hit that thumbs up button for you boys. Let's get those likes up. We got 733 people here in the chat. Let's get 700 likes, man. If you guys want to call in with your questions, with a prospect question, call us up 657 657- 383-1509 is the number to call. Um, the combine, was this, this was this was the first one you ever attended? Yeah. Well, yep. what, what was that experience like for you? Man, it was cool for me. Like, it was something that I always wanted to do. I watched it on ESPN for years when it would come on. And just being there, it, it kind of reminded me of how Summer League used to be for me. Like, my first Summer League was probably... 2011 no fans there you could like Mm -hmm. i give you an example the first summer league i went to uh the blazers were playing the pelicans and it was the year that dame and ad were drafted Mm -hmm. ad was playing with the olympic team i sat front row like just walked down there sat front row next to paul allen and neil o'shea Mm. summer league then the lonzo ball year changed it turned into like $40 $40 a day, mm-hmm, it turned into mm-hmm. a fan event, but you know, the NBA is a business, all about making money. Well, the combine reminded me of like how summer league used to be, except even more intimate in a sense. There's even agents aren't allowed to go into the arenas and to the gym. So oh. the only people there are um, scouts or people with a, a media credential and some media aren't allowed. So like, for example, and this is fitting that I'm on Knicks fan TV, the section that I sat in, was right by the entire Knicks front office. Nice. So Tibbs was probably four rows behind me. I, I sat next to everybody, got a couple of scouts that I'm cool with from the Knicks, mm. had a chance to chop it up with Tim Hardaway. Okay. And uh, and people were asking me, you know, did I talk to him about any prospects? And I was like, no, we just kind of talked about the draft. And he was more so talking about how players didn't participate at the combine mm. and then his story about how he went, what he went through going into the draft and, and so on. And how the competition he was able to, back in his day. Well, he said that he, um, because he came from UTEP, he didn't have yeah. the same name and he mentioned Sherman Douglas and right. some of these other guys. So he had to work his way up. And so he was saying how he had to compete to climb the, you know, climb up draft boards while this generation, not necessarily the players, but the agents are just like, nah, don't mm. play. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're fine. So, <laughs> being, I mean, it was it was a great experience. And um, like I said, I went to a lot of the pro days. I got to watch those mm. and just did a lot of networking and, um, you know, I mean, shaking hands with everybody from Mitch Kupchak to mm. to uh, Rob Palinka to Tibbs and all that. I mean, that dope. was a pretty cool experience. That, that's dope, man. Re- really dope. Um, now, speaking of tips, uh, Knicks did work out a handful of prospects today out, one of them being uh, Dyson Daniels. And, and this is a guy who his name has been been hot over the last couple of weeks. A lot of people think he's rising up in the lottery. Uh, what's your uh, uh, thoughts on, on Dyson Daniels, G League Ignite? Yeah, I think it's interesting that he's skyrocketing up draft boards without any games being played that's always very very interesting to me and sometimes you kind of have to decide is this like agent driven because like for example i mean my platform i have a little bit more power than i did before Uh but let's say and and it doesn't happen i'm just 
saying. Let's say I'm like, I heard that such and such is going to be a top three pick. Other people may start following and then it can help a, a prospect stock rise. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, I mean, there's been people saying like ESPN has the power to basically create a buzz for, for a player. Mm-hmm. So I'm not saying that this is the case, but I do find it interesting that his his uh, stock has skyrocketed despite I mean, we haven't they haven't played a game right. in a while. Uh, but he did grow. He measured well. And then I was at his pro day. He did shoot the ball well. And that was the mm. biggest, biggest thing, right? Con- concern about him was his outside shooting. Mm. Uh, I, I definitely could see him as in in the lottery, mm. in the back end of the lottery. But as far as up to five, I, I just think that's that's kind of high for me. I, I, I see him as Alonzo Ball type connective tissue. Mm. Mm-hmm. He can be your primary ball handler. He can be your secondary. He can defend multiple positions. For me personally, I I like point guards that can get to the rack and break the defense down, mm-hmm. get downhill. Guys that I know, like at the end of the shot clock, go go get busy. Yeah. So he's somebody that I would probably miss out on because. I mean, if I'm in the lottery, I'm I'm selecting a point guard that I think can be dynamic as opposed to a connective tissue. Yeah, I, I can certainly agree with that. But, you know, the versatility is certainly attractive, especially for this Knicks team that I think is quite one dimensional in, in a multitude of ways. What do you think is his, his best trait, though? You know, a lot of people look at a lot of different facets of, of his game. What do you think is his best skill set right now? Uh, the versatility, like you said, I think he can defend multiple positions. He can run a team. He can be your, you know, like, for example, let's say you have a undersized point guard that's not really a point that likes to score. I think you can play him with Dyson Daniels. I think his game allows him to be a complimentary player, especially if he can knock down open shots. He could be a complimentary player next to to anybody. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I mean, there's a, a, a demand for wing ball handlers that are 6'8", six, 6'7", six, I mean, you look at Boston has a few, so I, I, I get the appeal. Mm. What do you think is the the right way? You said wait towards the end of the lottery for Dyson Daniels. So actually, let me let me rephrase this question. Do you think it's all concerning that he's getting this much hype and he's actually skyrocketing up uh, the draft boards like this? Because is that a, a cause for concern of like drafting too high of a player where you're now giving him a larger you know, even though it's a rookie scale contract, a larger contract though on a rookie scale, and you're not going to get that 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 performance value that you could you could you could have gotten from another player. I mean, I think it all just boils down to fit, right? Let's say, let's say, you know, he goes to New York, and I'm just speaking hypothetically, mm-hmm. and the shooting hasn't really translated. That's not going to be the best fit for him because. The floor is going to be, it's not going to be a lot of spacing anywhere. So I think for him, Washington could be a good fit if mm-hmm. Bill is there mm-hmm. because you already have like your, you know, your your big time score. And then his role is to be a distributor and, and defender and, um, you know, just kind of be a, a table setter. They don't really need someone to, to get downhill and, and, and create the offense. Um Kind of like Halliburton. I was, mm-hmm. I, I liked Halliburton, but I wasn't as high on him as others because, again, I like my point guard to be able to get downhill and be disruptive on offense. Halliburton is great at what he does. He can knock down open shots. Mm-hmm. He's a great passer. and uh, But I always feel like Halliburton is probably at his best if he's playing a complementary role next to a dynamic guard. So I would love to see Halliburton on a team like the Knicks, I think he would be a perfect compliment for RJ Barrett, where you know Barrett is going to do what he does, and then Halliburton can be your safety valve and your your table setter. So I think if Dyson Daniels can knock down open shots, he could be that guy. But again, it's it's you know yeah. a preference for me. I, I like you know give me some to the rack that yeah. if he goes three for eleven, he still might get me nine free throw attempts. That's just my personal preference. 
Same, same here. You mentioned uh, Tyrese Halliburton. Draft time. Shout out to my guy Jay from Florida if he's still in the chat. He did, he did <laughs> shout you out, man. He, he's, he's very famous with his Halliburton takes. He's, he's been trying to run away from that now. You know, he's hoping time as time passes, you know, people will forget. But we don't forget here on Next Fan TV. Number one show for the fans by the fans. Salute to everybody in the chat once again. Hit that thumbs up button for you boys. You know, I, I think that Dyson Daniels is certainly intriguing. He did say today after his uh, workout with the Knicks that uh, that they did view him as a point guard. I just I'm wondering not just with Daniels, but with any pick, um, you know, how much do they go for experience versus upside? You know, especially with Tibbs, right? Everybody who they've drafted so far has had two at least two years experience, whether it's Obi, Quickly, Grimes, McBride. You know, all these guys uh, have have had some experience in at the college level. So I just wonder, with a guy like this, would they have patience for his development? Would they go somewhere somewhere else uh, with with a little bit more um, experience? Now, the the next guy that they that they um, worked out, and it wasn't today, but this guy has been kind of intriguing to me the more I do research on him, and that's uh, Tari Eason out of LSU. Mm-hmm. What, what do you think about Tari Eason's game? I like him a lot, man. He is a defensive playmaker. So I think the I mean it's Knicks fan TV, so I think they'd understand it. You remember the the hoopers and basketball players debate? Tari Eason is a hooper. Like mm-hmm. I can watch guys and tell, like, all right, this guy grew up playing with a trainer. He grew up playing in a gym where he was dribbling off cones, doing imaginary moves against chairs. Mm-hmm. And someone just kind of made him robotic. Tari Eason, uh, he grew up hooping at the park. He just has this, uh, I mean, some of the instincts that you only get from just running up and down playing pickups. So when I Mm. interviewed him at the combine, I was one of my questions. And he laughed like, yeah, like, Mm. yeah, I'm just a a hooper. So I think he'd be a, a good fit in New York because he... I mean, on one possession, he can block a shot. The next possession, he can get a steal. He can take it coast to coast. Game is kind of a little, little raw in a sense, mm-hmm. but he just has that, those instincts that you just get from just playing pickup ball. Like, he's mm-hmm. someone that he may not look great in a workout, right? Because, you know, in the workout, they're probably like, all right, we want you to shoot mm-hmm. corner threes. We want you to relocate, pump fake, jab, wonderful pull up. But then you put some butts in the seats, you put five on five and just say, hey, let's get up and down. I think that's where he's really going to going to shine. So um, again, I just think that he has the defense to where he can guard multiple positions, six, eight, two, 17, huge hands. And uh, I didn't realize how important the hands were until I was talking to a friend of mine and he played in the NBA. He was just talking about Kawhi. I used to ask him questions like, is Kawhi really that good? He was like, man, that dude's fingers are this long. He's like, when, <laughs> when you're dribbling in front of him, he's getting a little finger on the ball all the time. And he was like, even like with his arms and his fingers, you can't even throw like skip passes. And he was like, it's that l- those little things that you don't really see. So I could see Eason. It's 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 a huge comparison, but I could see him being like this versatile, disruptive defender that blocks shots, gets steals. I mean, he has like two steals a game in like two 24 steals. minutes. Two steals, yeah. The shot is on paper, I think he shot like 36% from three. Mm-hmm. 35. So mm-hmm. it's respectable, but it's kind of like a low shot put. And I remember at, the, at his pro day, I sat next to some scouts and they were saying like, I don't know if he'll be able to get that off with NBA length because it's mm. such a low shot. So I don't know if he'll need to change it or make it a little bit faster, but it just depends on the gravity. You know, if you have a, you know, a a primary ball handler that is, you know, collapsing the defense, then it it, it helps a guy with a slower release to be able to get it off. But I like him a lot. It's just a, it's, I think he's a four, but if you Mm. keep Randall, which I know he's, Knicks fans want Randall yes. out of there. Yeah, well, yeah, and we'll talk about that. Yep. <laughs> it, it's a, I mean, it creates a log jam at the four spot. It, it kind of reminds me of Jaron Jackson. I don't know. What, what do you think about that comparison? Um, I think Jaron is a natural four or five. Four or five, yeah. I, I think that Tari is a more so of a, of a three, four. Jaron is an incredible rim protector, mm-hmm. but I could see like 
you know, the ability to switch out and, and defend multiple positions. Like Jaron Jackson's game is not like visually a pleasing yeah. to me it's kind of funny the looking shot is the, crazy looking but shot it's, it's is effective. crazy looking and he's someone that you know i would have been wrong on at, at that draft mm. i would have kind of been like uh i don't know i mean i wouldn't have i probably would have let him i probably had a few guys a couple spots higher but i would have definitely been yeah. wrong with him there yeah i mean i think al the thing that 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 I think why he appeals to me is yes, he's, he, he might not be the igniter that we're necessarily looking for, but in terms of overall fit, uh, you know, fit next to RJ, I, I think, you know, having that type of athleticism that checks the box for me, multi-positional defender, right? I mean, Raphael says he leans forward, but maybe he can guard some threes as well. He can and, definitely guard threes. And, and I look at it like, you know, yes, we don't have that initiator, but how do we help our offense? Well, we can help our offense with a guy who can play tenacious defense, with a guy who can get takeaways. I mean, look at, look at, I look at uh, Memphis's offense. Yes, they have John Morant, you know, superstar, forget about that. But in the half court, their offense was quite pedestrian. But the reason why their overall offense was so good was number one, offensive rebounds, and number two, takeaways. They were top, top two, top four. In, uh, in transition buckets, and that was a lot of that was off of steals, blocks, so on and so forth. You have R.J. Barrett, you have Obi Toppin, two guys who excel in transition in the fast break. You know, having a guy like an Eason who can who can help you help your offense a little bit. Um, I, I think through his defense, I think that would be helpful. Yeah, I, I agree hundred percent. It's just like does the Knicks style on offense? You know, if it's if it's a slow down style, then I think you can run into some spacing space spacing mm-hmm, issues mm-hmm. there. Um, but I like him a lot. I mean, I think he'd be a fan favorite. He's one that yeah, you know, I, I can be a little biased towards because I really like these guys that kind of come out of nowhere. They're not spoiled. They're not they haven't been reading about themselves since they were twelve years old as being the next star. So they play with this chip on their shoulder when I talked to him and you know my first question was I said man where were a year ago where were you at you transferred from Cincinnati to LSU barely made a blip on social media nobody cared and here you are you are at the NBA combine you're a possible lottery pick and he just kind of lit up like a Christmas tree like man I put in the work I worked so hard to to get here and so when I see a guy like that who wasn't, you know, a top 10 recruit, wasn't a McDonald's All-American. He had to earn everything that that he has. And so I think, like, those are the type of guys that I would I would fall in love with in, in as far as drafting because I, I think there's, there's still this motivation of proving that they belong as opposed to, yeah, I mean, I knew I was going to be here. So I, I like him for New York. I feel like that fits kind of like the the narrative of like the young kids on the Knicks. Like you have people, even though RJ is like the the, the pride and joy of most Knicks fans, you, you know, there's still doubt around the NBA. Can he be a, like a consistent shooter? Can he be a guy they can have a rely on in the offense? You know, there's questions about Obi Toppin, whether or not that he can play, you know, uh, uh, be a solid power forward, whether or not quickly could be a true starting point guard in this league. I feel like there's a lot of questions around the Knicks. And the, the thing that you talked about is that, you know, Tariq Eason, right? He puts in the work, he puts in the effort to get there, and he kind of fits that mold of what this young Knicks core has going on right now. Guys who like to be in the gym, make sure they put in the time and effort to improve their game. But I want to get back to the spacing question that you that you know that CP brought up and that you touched on, Raphael, is that you know I, I've been reading that Eason is kind of a, a slasher, right? Like he likes to look for the open court or a guy even you know even in the half half court. Why you still look for the open lane and get to the to the rim? That's something the Knicks have whacked on. Do you think that's something that could help translate to something like a Knicks team where we didn't have that? You know, the the only guy that we had was Cam, and, and Cam got barely like enough playing time to really show that. Do you think that's something that could help with the spacing issue for the Knicks? As far as his ability to slash and attack the rim? Yep. Yeah, I think he did a lot of his slashing in transition and um but he played some four in college where he was kind of like a, a a matchup nightmare because, you know, he played the four some, but he has, like I was saying, these playground skills, you know, on the playground, everybody can handle the ball. Everybody can, you know, make, make decisions and pass a little bit. And so he was just out there hooping for LSU. That's, that's why I liked him. Now, hopefully, 
you know, if he does end up in New York, he gets that same freedom to be himself. I would hate to see him kind of put into a box and you kind of restrict him from being him. And again, I, he is a little raw on offense, so he is going to need some developmental minutes. It's just when I look at it from a Knicks perspective, are they going to be okay with him making some of them mistakes that come with him being, you know, a, a guy that you can't say is your traditional four, you know, how like in the NBA now mm -hmm. it's three and D it is vertical lob threat stretch four. he's not any of those. He's just a ball player. So it's definitely going to take the right coach and understanding the best ways to maximize his gifts. So like, I want to touch, I want to ask you that question about him being like a, a, a more of a four than a three, right? It, do you think he could play the three more so if he comes to the NBA, or do you think he's just because of his college experience, four is just the best place for him to be playing at? Well, I think he'd have the best advantages at the four, but okay. I like to judge guys off of the position that I think they'll play in a closing lineup as opposed to a starting lineup. Mm -hmm. So you know, normally the best five guys close games, but the best five guys don't normally start games. So I think he is a more so of a matchup problem at the four because he can beat fours off the dribble mm -hmm. a lot better than he could if he had threes guarding him. Okay. Let's uh, let's hit the reset button real quick. So let's everybody in the chat. Once again, hit that thumbs up button for you boys. Uh, Nick's, draft q a with special guest rafael barlow of the nba draft big board make sure you guys are hitting that subscribe button share this video share this video right now we got a thousand people in the chat right now let's get up to two thousand share this video right now on twitter facebook email somebody text somebody let's uh let's double up the uh the count and see if we can get some more people in here definitely appreciate everybody for tuning in we are going through our prospect breakdowns Knicks today have worked out uh dyson daniels they did work out Tari Eason. It wasn't today, but I think it was sometime last week, and we're going to get into a couple more prospects who they did work out. Remember that this show is presented by Manscaped, fellas. Go to manscaped.com, enter promo code KFTV for 20% off plus free shipping. It's getting hot out here, especially on the East Coast here in New York, fellas. So make sure that you guys are utilizing the number one men's grooming tool below the waist. Do not be caught out there lacking, fellas, before you go out on those dates cover the family jewels man make sure we're, we're, we're going into the jordan season all right some of you guys had a regular viewers of the show we know about the jordan or the van gundy i don't have to get too descriptive you know what i mean <laughs> we're, we're, we're in full-blown jordan season fellas make sure you act accordingly all right now this one is the uh the custom purple joint that i got uh for testicular cancer awareness man shout out to my guys at, at manscape for sending me this one i do have an extra one that i'll give away during the draft but uh for you guys at home Go ahead and go get your a lawnmower 4.0, manscaped.com, promo code KFTV, 20% off plus free shipping. They have a number, a number of other Manscaped products, man. You're covered from head to toe. Uh, great product, man. So make sure you guys check it out. Support our sponsors. And here we go back to our prospect breakdowns. Now, the other player who the Knicks did work out today, um, Raphael, is Ty Ty Washington. Now, from what I'm getting, the, the, the sense that I'm getting from these Knicks fans, they're not too high on him, man. Where do you stand on Ty Ty? He's tough to, man, he's tough to evaluate because, one, you, you always have to factor in Kentucky players, especially their guards, outperform their draft position. Mm. You can go look at Devin Booker. You can look at Shea Gilchrist Alexander. You can look at Tyrese Maxey. Yes. Tyler Hero, all of these guys would be drafted much higher in a redraft. Yeah. So, at least for me, I factor that in, that everybody at Kentucky has to sacrifice. I even talked to Bam Adebayo last summer, and I'm, I'm a Blazers fan. I was mm -hmm. asking him, how in the world did my Trailblazers think Zach Collins was better? <laughs> mm -hmm. And he said, well, you know, at Kentucky, you have to sacrifice. And he mm -hmm. said, when, when you evaluate a player from Kentucky, look at some of their high school film, because there may be some stuff that they could do that they did in high school that they can't do in, in um, at, at Kentucky. And then he used Carl Anthony Towns as an example. Mm. We never saw him shoot at Kentucky. Mm. So on one hand, you have to keep that in the back of your mind. Then he did have some amazing games this year. Like I think he had like a 13 of 16 shooting game against Tennessee. 
if I'm not mistaken, he had a game where he had like 17 points and 17 assists. And then once he sprained his ankle, it kind of went downhill. He never really recovered. Mm. Now, on the other hand, you look at him and you say, all right, he's a little bit older for his class. I think he's like, I want to say he was just a few months younger than Wendell Moore, who was a junior and mm. Ty Ty was a freshman. So he was like a 20 year old freshman. He's not a great athlete. He's not going to beat guys off the dribble. Hmm. Um, he can shoot the ball. I mean, he can definitely shoot the ball. Has a nice floater, good soft touch. But, you know, it's kind of like he may not have that sexiness to his game that you like. So I can understand why some people may not be a fan of him. But, again, like I said, with Kentucky guards, you might have to give them the benefit of the doubt because, I mean, Tyrese Maxey fell to 20, like 21. Mm -hmm. And there were some concerns about his shooting or maybe the low release on his shot. And if he was a one or a two and, and now look at him. So, yeah. um, but yeah, I, I have seen, I, I did mock tie tie to the Knicks a few times and I, mm -hmm. I, I definitely got the comments. You, you, yeah. You caught, you caught the wrath. You caught the wrath. All good. <laughs> I all, caught it. Yeah. All, all good. Um, yeah. And I, I love Maxie's game from even before he got drafted. I was hoping we would have gotten him. And I think the Knicks did want him. And once he was out of their, their reach, I believe they did trade back. And then, then that's how they got quickly. But in the way that you described Ty Ty a little bit, you know, the floater, you know, can't get to the rim consistently, so on and so forth, kind of sounds like quickly. To, to a they, where do you go to school at? at Kentucky. Kentucky. <laughs> so, I but guess, he outplayed his draft position, I feel like. You know, he's yeah. uh, in a redraft. I think he goes higher than where he was actually selected. Yeah. So so I guess, you know, how do you see these two guys stacking up? Do you see Ty Ty as, as a better pro prospect than quickly? Um, I, I think, well, I think so. And it depends on where he's drafted. If he ends mm -hmm. up, let's say he does go to a team in the mid first round. I think that he will have a better opportunity to like earn minute. Well, not even earn minutes. They'll give him minutes. I think mm. quickly had to, you know, he had to earn his minutes in mm -hmm. a sense. Mm -hmm. A lot of people didn't know what they got out of, out of quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it, it depends, you know, if, if he, let's say he, like I said, if he goes mid first round, then, I mean, they're, they're definitely going to put him in the best position to succeed quickly was, you know, in the later first round. And, you know, sometimes guys that where he was drafted at don't even get any time. So um, I think they'll be similar. I really think they'll be similar. But I, I talked to somebody that was at his pro day and they weren't impressed at all. Um, mm. The the comment that I that I heard was he shot lights out, but there was no energy. He walked from station to station, just mm. very cool pace as if he didn't realize like, it's a job interview. Yeah, but right, they right. said that he shot the lights out. And the question was, is that just him? Is that just his own personal pace to where you feel like, all right, is he engaged or are you just over overthinking it? Because the guys that he was working out with were, you know, they, they kind of had a little bit more intensity to their workout. So um, again, I wasn't there, but this was just the feedback that I got. So for like Ty Ty, right? Like, CP already noted that similar to Emmanuel quickly. How would that even work out like on the Knicks? Like how, because I see him as another six, three guard. He doesn't really, he's not the quickest guy on the court. Right. So then his shoot, you're, you're saying that he has to be, he is he even that good of a three point shooter. I feel like he didn't really shoot that well in college from three. So what is he going to outside of the floater and inside scoring? How is he going to at least offer something different? So redundant. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I do think they're too redundant. I, I, I do think that they are too similar. I don't think you need both. Um, his shooting percentage, like he shot 35% from three, but his numbers took a major decline after he sprained his ankle. And so it, it, the numbers aren't really telling the, the whole story. I mean, shout out to him for trying to tough it out and come back. I mean, I, I've seen guys shut it down when they have a – injury like he had um but like i said he had some of the i mean he had some really impressive games earlier this year and then he doesn't turn the ball over that much i mean one thing i will say is that he does have a a pretty decent assist to turnover ratio and um yeah but 
to me, if I'm the Knicks, if I have quickly, then I don't need Ty Ty. Uh, agreed on that. Now, the last guy that they worked out today, at least, is uh, Malachi Branham out of Ohio State. Uh, what, what's your thoughts on Malachi Branham? So the best way to describe his game is like, you ever been to like the park and there's this old school dude with the with the sweats on? Yeah. He never takes his off. <laughs> yeah. Everything he does is just efficient and a couple dribbles, mm-hmm. nothing extra. That's Malachi Brennan. He reminds me of like Chris Middleton in a sense. Mm. Middleton, he's going to get to his mid-range off of a couple dribbles, not flashy. Like you never go, even though Middleton's an all-star, he's an NBA champion. You'll never go to a park and see a kid say Middleton. <laughs> you know what right, I mean? right. Like, like he just, he's efficient, gets to his spots, gets buckets. And to me, that's Branham. Even though he shot like 41% from three, it was on a small volume of attempts. Mm. And he prefers the mid range pull up over the, you know, over shooting threes, which, you know, in today's NBA, especially the analytics driven NBA, people love the three point shot. Mm. I think with his touch, he should be able to develop it but he is a reluctant three-point shooter. And from what I've heard from different people, he's had some issues like adjusting to the three-point line and some of his workouts. Mm. And I was at his pro day and I mean, he shot the ball well, Mm. but not as well as you would think based off of his numbers in college, but he is a a good passer. He can be a, a, an additional ball handler. So as far as like from the Knicks, I actually kind of like the fit in a sense, Mm. especially next to someone like RJ to where he could be this floor spacer that can also be like a a guy that can make plays for others. He's not just your three-point shooter that really can't do anything else. And he's sneaky athletic. Like, he doesn't look like a good athlete, but then every once in a while he'll make a play, and you're like, ah, okay, you know, he's he's got a little bounce in his step. So I'm actually like that fit. Al, anything on, uh, on Branham? Uh I guess for like Branham, right? You said he would fit. You say he would help RJ with the the four spacing, right? Yep. So if if he if he progresses as a three point shooter, like I think he can, yeah. Okay, so then what would he offer if he had to be in this rotation day one? What is he going to offer for for the next moving forward? Like is he just coming a, off the bench, just being like a what what type of score, or just being a three and D guy? Um, I I think. You know, Fournier's there. I think he he would come off the bench. I mean, you know, it's it's hard to say that he's better than Evan Fournier right now. I mean, you hope that he will be later on. But, I mean, I think he would give the Knicks just another wing that can, you know, knock down shots, make plays for others. Um, he has the size as far as strength. I mean, he, he definitely has a, a maturity to his game. And he's a young freshman. Um, so, he, I think he does have um, – have the upside that that I mean he can come in and be a contributor, but you know in an open in an open I, I don't want to use tryout, but in an open camp is mm-hmm. he better than Miles McBride? I don't know. <laughs> Interesting. Not McBride. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Grimes. Um, Grimes. Grimes. Yes. Grimes. Yes. Interesting. Well, that, well, Grimes is a solid defender. How's his defense? I mean, I think he's a good defender. Mm. Um, again, he's young. So, um, you know, the Big Ten is a – I mean, I wouldn't say the Big Ten is this conference where guys are getting up and down the floor a lot. So mm. the pace is a little bit slower. So I think some guys can be hidden mm. as, as bad defenders because the pace is slow. Mm. But, I mean, I don't think he's going to be like a, a bad defender. I mean, I think at the very minimum he should be able to, you know, be a plus defender. So to everybody in the chat, once again, hit that thumbs up on the free boys. NBA draft Q&A with Raphael Barlow. Let's get to the phones. Area code 917. What's your name? Where are you calling in from? Hello? 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 Oh, 917 is not ready. You got to be ready for your debut, people. Um, I do want to highlight the super chat real quick. Um, someone was asking about uh, Daylon, Daylon Terry. And shout out to Richard uh, for the super chat, Dalen Terry. What, what's your thoughts on him? Uh, a high upside prospect, skinny, very confident, very very confident. Um, was that his? He was at the combine. He didn't play. I thought he should have played. Uh, I sat next to a scout that watched him work out, and the scout's comment was, 
I don't think he can shoot. He got hot towards the end of the season, and the numbers show that he's a better shooter. The numbers make him look like a better shooter than he is. Mm. And the scout's comment was he thought that he should return to school. If he returns to school, he's possibly first-team All-American and a surefire first-round pick if he progresses. And with the NIL money that he could get, it really didn't make sense for him. So, I mean, this scout is obviously projecting him to be a second round pick. Mm-hmm. Um, I've heard some rumblings that he could be late first round. Uh, but I mean, he he is a, you know, this ball handler that has size, kind of like Dyson Daniels in a sense, like, you know, what, what scouts like out of Dyson Daniels, they would like out of, out of Terry. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I like the versatility. He should be able to defend multiple positions. All right, shout out to Richard Phillips for the super chat. Let's go to our area code 470. What's your name? Where are you tapping in from? 470. All right, coming in from Atlanta there, CCP. Well, nice, and, nice. Uh, yeah, Raphael, I'm a huge fan of yours. I was listening to you and CP out in uh, Mexico for a very long time until I finally Don't came know. back uh, into the state. Thanks, man. I appreciate Usman that. Dang. What's your thoughts? Usman Dang. Thanks for calling me. I like him, man. I'm I'm gonna do a little quick, short Twitter video on him, and uh, he got off to like a rough start. Like, I mean, his start was bad. It was like three mm. points per game, twenty percent from the floor, seventeen percent from three, and I sold my stock on him early, but now I've uh, I've got it back. And I was I was talking to his teammate Hugo Besson, who um, is also a you know projected second round pick. And what I did not realize, and that's why sometimes you got to put stuff into context, is that when he was, he's 18 years old, he was at the time, he just turned 19, Mm. he went to Australia by himself, and Australia had super strict COVID restrictions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, imagine you're 18 years old and you go to another continent, not not even another state, another continent. Mm -hmm. And I think for Americans, the adjustment may be a little easier because, you know, we speak English and they speak English there. Mm -hmm. Well, for him, he goes to this totally different continent. The time zone is crazy. It takes your body a while to adjust. And he was there. He couldn't have his family with him because of their restrictions. So I think that played a major, major role in his early season struggles. But then by the end of the season, he started to look like the player that people thought he was going to be. Mm. And uh, I met him last year in LA and I saw him at the combine. He's gotten bigger. He's about 6'10 now. Mm. He's put on some muscle and um, just very, very smooth. Again, 6'10 can handle the ball, um, can just do a lot of different things. Now, I mean, would Knicks fans be open to another French prospect? <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, man. So. I don't know, man. I don't know. Between Frank <laughs> Fortier, the Go Bear Rubens, I don't know, man. I, I you know, I, I can't cast a surgeons on the kid. I don't know him. You know him, but I, I don't know. That's all. So, yeah, I, I was joking saying, like, dang, you know, he would, uh, he would probably get some unfair criticism just because of his passport. Yes, yes. no question. <laughs> no question. Unrealistic, but I mean, it, it, you know, that's just how we are. Uh, shout out to uh, Tarani Harold, $20 super chat. Says CP Alex, thanks for always putting on a quality show. Huge fan. Shout out to Ronnie, man. And uh, shout out to the guy calling from ATL uh, by way of Mexico was tapping in earlier man so we've been following Raphael's career for quite some time so that's definitely dope uh let's get to uh, area code 929 929 what's your name where you tapping in from yo that's me yep loud and clear jj from Staten Island jj from Staten Island so Shaolin so let's go let's go yeah bro yo I've seen this story before you know with Ty Ty Washington and stuff I've seen this story before mm-hmm. where a guy like before I was looking at mock drafts like, most of the time I was seeing, bro, in the, the top 10, bro. And now I'm seeing him as low as, like, 20. And because he got injured, you know, now that stock has been falling. I've seen that story before. I've also seen the story with Dyson. Dyson Daniels, someone who I've seen in the beginning of the season at 20. Now he's I'm hearing as, as high as five he can go. And that's just giving me Dante excellent vibes. Mm. I don't know how y'all feel about that. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're both Australian? <laughs> <laughs> Nah, man, it's not even that, bro. Like, I mean, that that's definitely part of the reason, bro. But it's like, I don't know. Like, this guy, I didn't, I barely heard of him. Like, I heard of him, of course, but I barely heard of him going this high in the lottery until, like, two weeks ago. 
And that's like that 2014 draft. It was the same thing with Dante Exum. Oh, he's six seven. He's a six six point guard. He can play defense. He can connect. It was the same thing. Yeah, okay. Maybe yeah, I'm, it was yeah. kind of similar. It was kind of similar. Not gonna lie. But you know what though? At least I, I'd say I, I get the point. But I say the difference is at least we saw Dyson Daniels play an entire season. Fair enough. Now the the crazy rise is different. Exum played at the Hoop Summit and they hit him. Now. To me, a, a more accurate comparison to Dante Exum would be Shade and Sharp. Mm. That that would be mm. because mm. Sharp. I mean, he didn't Miss, play. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he didn't play, and now I've I've seen him as high as four. And and shout out to Rob Palinka because Rob Palinka was representing Exum at the time. And I think sometimes as an agent, your job is to either get your player in the best position to succeed or sometimes the agent knows like my guy don't have it. His Mm. buzz is high. I'm going to get him the most money in his pocket right now. And I think Palinka didn't think Exum had him. And so he hid him for a whole year and just let that wave from the hoop summit ride out. And now Exum is Yoko teammate (laughs) in Barcelona. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's a good comparison. I didn't even think about that one. Yeah, man. Yeah, well, I, I I saw that one before. I, I definitely saw that one before, the Dante X of comparisons. Let's go to uh, Airy Coach 609. What's your name and where you tapping in from? What's up, man? This is Val from Jersey, man. How Val in the building. Val, what's good, man? How you feeling? Been a minute, bro. How's everything? As I know it's been a minute. I've been keeping up with the shows, but oftentimes we talk about the first round, but I want to talk about a player that we could get in the second round. What's your thoughts on mm-hmm. um, Julian Champagne from St. John? Mm-hmm. He's like a pure knockdown shooter, and I believe like at his 6'8 frame, his ability just to shoot, and he's like athletic also. What's your thoughts on the Knicks possibly bringing the Brooklyn kid that's good friends with Obi back, you know, keep mm-hmm. him in, in New York? Thank you, guys, man, and Appreciate congrats, CP. Appreciate it. Appreciate it, Val. Thanks for always supporting us, man. Buckets. I mean, that's the first thing I think of when I think of Champagne. He just he gets buckets. Mm. He is, man, he's a guy that's kind of hard to put into a box. And when I talked about like a guy that just looked like he just been hooping, like him and his twin brother just been at the parks and that's how they got better. That's what his game is like. I mean, he's got that playground game where he, he'll post you up. He'll knock down open shots. Mm. He can drive to the basket. He finishes around the rim like somebody that's been playing 21. Is that Do y'all play 21 in New York or do y'all have a different name for of it? Of course. Yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, like every city kind of has a, a, a different name. Yeah, I think like, yeah. I think they play like the 32 in Chicago. But he has that toughness where it's like I'm used to driving to the rack with nine guys at the rim ready to, <laughs> to foul me and I'm, mm. I'm crafty enough. So I, I mean, I like his game. Uh, luckily for him, he can shoot the ball. So if he's not allowed to play the same role that he played at St. John's as a scorer, I, I do think the shooting allows him to be a, a complimentary player. Mm. And, um, you know, his brother left early and was in the Raptors organization. So, I mean, that'd be dope for that family to have, you know, two, two kids in the, in the NBA. Um, I don't know if he goes as high as 42. I mean, mm. it, it could be a possibility. Um, but I mean, I, I, I do think that he's someone that, um, the Knicks should definitely have on their radar. Interesting. So to everybody in the chat, once again, hit that thumbs up on free boys. Let's get those likes up. 1000 people in here on the check in NBA draft Q and a with specials guest Raphael Barlow, man. Let's share these videos, subscribe to the channel, hit that thumbs up on notification bell, all that good stuff. Airy code six, three, one, six, three, one. What's your name? Where are you tapping in from? Tom. From hunting there he is, Tom. What's good, my guy? How you feeling? Price, price picks, manscape. Know the vibes. CP, you already know what I think about you. Mm-hmm. The yep. world. Alex, love the look. Keep doing your job. Excellent work. Mm-hmm. Uh, quick question for Rafael Barlow. Mm-hmm. A few years ago, I think you had mentioned about possibly uh, maybe Julius going to the um, <laughs> the Blazers. Yes. Right. Can you talk to your people? Have them make it work and make make it happen, okay? Number one. Number two, if it does happen at number seven, between Matherin and Davis, who should the Knicks pick? Thanks for taking my call. Mm. You guys have a wonderful evening. We'll talk soon. Rapid fire. Rapid fire time from Hunter knows the vibes. 
and he's ready. We did that. He that was perfect segue. Tom always knows how to get us to the next topic, and that is a potential mm-hmm. trade up because Portland is sitting there at seven. It's been said all along that they they're trying to build with Dame time over thirty and all. They're trying to go all in with Dame time, keep him happy. They ship CJ out of there. They have the seventh pick. You're a Blazers fan. What right. are you thinking right now? <laughs> all right. So here's here's the the. Uh... My issue with with this Julius Randle to Portland trade, right? Mm-hmm. I like Julius. I think that he would be, mm-hmm. you know, a good fit next to Portland. Mm-hmm. So Knicks fans, have, for two years now, well, I guess they it took a break last yeah, year. Yeah, we took a break last year. We took, oh, we yeah. took a break, break last, last year. year. Yeah, yeah. Then it's back up. Yeah. And it's funny how many people remember that conversation from two years ago. <laughs> yeah, I and, and I remember somebody saying they would fly to Dallas to help him pack his bags to go to Portland. Right. So one of the things like, and you know, I'll, I'll respond to the comments and I say, well, if Blazers, if Portland knows that Julius's stock is low, why would they offer the seventh pick? So everybody's like, oh, he was all NBA. Yeah, now, now they try to up, bump up the stock. Do that. Up. You got to love it. You can't make it so up. So why don't, why don't y'all want him? <laughs> so, um, yeah, that. All right, so here's my thought on that trade. Mm. It, I mean, it gets the Knicks off of Randall, mm. which I think the the fan base would be excited about. Mm. Portland gives up a young prospect for Randall. Does Randall help Portland move into the top four? Right. Mm. So unless they get Randall, and then even if they get like, I don't know, a, a free agent. Does that push them into a championship contender? No, it makes them better. It it may even just put them in the same position they were in the years before, seventh, eighth seed, and you 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 know you get a little better. But then let's say they do get Randall right, and Portland ends up being the eighth seed, and then they lose in the first round to the playoffs the next year. Right. Now Dame can say, you know what? I gave it a shot. I'm out of here. Right. Now we gave up a young prospect, and now Randall is the face of the Blazers <laughs> franchise. <laughs> no backseats. No backseats. Back. So Portland gambled um, a couple years ago by trading Gary Trent for Norm Powell. Then they re-signed yes. Norm for like 90. Trent signs to in Toronto for like 54 Mm -hmm. so there's like a 40 million dollar difference there then they end up trading powell for justice winslow keon johnson and eric bledsoe's contract so it's like the blazers are in this crazy predicament because they have a new gm and of course no new gm wants to be the guy that walks in and trades dame lillard a small market team with a guy that wants to be there Mm -hmm. So that's that's kind of like my Blazers, my whole Blazers rant. So on one hand, if I'm Portland, I don't think it's worth the gamble because I don't think Randall is enough to get you into a top four seed and then Dame could still leave. And now you're left with, you know, you traded a young piece. Now, if that let's say that trade does happen, like the caller said, I think Matherin would be the better yeah. fit next to RJ. Mm-hmm. I, I like Johnny Davis. Not, I don't know how much you guys have watched Johnny Davis, but here's a, something that a scout told me that made me think. He says he likes Johnny Davis as a scorer, but he said his best attribute is how hard he plays. Mm. He plays hard every possession, and he's a guy that you know is going to give you maximum effort. The scout's concern was he compared him to Kyle Lowry. So you're probably thinking, like, that's, that's a weird comparison. Mm. Well, he said with Kyle Lowry, he plays maximum effort during the regular season and then during the playoffs when everybody else goes to another level Lowry doesn't have one yeah yeah. and he said that's why he thinks Lowry struggles so Mm. his question was if you draft Johnny Davis he's gonna again 82 games give you maximum effort but then he's a guy that the fan base will probably turn on in the playoffs because Mm. now once he doesn't have that advantage because they were like the best players in the NBA I mean, they play hard, but they have another level another that level. they can yes. get to. Yes. Yep. So that was his concern. After that, it, it really made me think about it. Like, all right, so let's say he does go to the Knicks. He's going to be a fan favorite during the regular season. Mm. But then during the playoffs, and I mean, and think about that Knicks team last year that made it to the playoffs. 
I mean, on one hand, as an outsider, I feel like they overachieved because they played harder than everybody else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But then during the playoffs, they didn't have another level they that they could it. get to. They didn't have it. They got exposed. Only yeah, only they, D Rose was able to get there about half of the time, <laughs> pretty much. That was and it. he was kind of pacing himself throughout basically, the year. Basically, yeah. Do you do you think Matherin has that next level? Yeah, I just think that he's a a a good fit because at the okay. minimum he's your three and D guy that doesn't necessarily need the ball in his hands every play to be effective, and um, I think that he made some strides as like a pick and roll ball handler and a ball handler in the sophomore year, so he can be a guy that okay. Once he's knocking down shots, he can attack a closeout. He could be a secondary ball handler, and he he's he's a guy that that I think that can uh, can help. But here's another thing: it's it's cool that I get to talk to these different scouts. And there was a scout that mentioned that he liked Matherin in a West Coast type offense where they're getting up and down the court. Mm -hmm. But he said Matherin struggled when teams made him play half court, and he mentioned a game in a tournament where. Houston kind of was physical, kind of slowed it down and mm. kind of got in his airspace and he wasn't the same player. So this particular scout mentioned he likes Matherin in the Western Conference as opposed to the Eastern Conference. Mm. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. I, I think, you know, look, um, my inbox has been flooded since the season is over with, with Randall Trades. Since it's since the trade deadline with Randall trades, all right, uh, you know Knicks fans they they try to sell you every which way, left, right, and center of why he'd be good for the other team, but he's he's been terrible for us. Um, I think the Knicks are gonna find themselves in a similar situation that they did trying to send him to Sacramento, where there's better options out there, and for Sacramento that was the bonus, and for for the Blazers I think. The Jeremy Grant stuff is real. We've been hearing it since the trade deadline. I think he's a better player than Julius. I think he's a more versatile player than Julius. He's a better defender than Julius. I think the Blazers need that. You know, I, I don't I don't think either one is helping them win the championship, but I, I think Grant would be better suited uh, with the Blazers team. And so, I mean, maybe, maybe Julius is a plan B. Who knows? Anything is possible. I just, but, but my point is, is that I think there are other options out there to, to, send that to use that that number seven pick than Julius Randle whose value is in the mud right now. I, I think, well, that's, I think a, that, that's a hard sell. Julius his value is in the mud because of the Knicks fan base. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, because if you just think about it, like you remove yourself from a situation, Jeremy Grant played his best basketball in Detroit on a very bad team. Mm. At least Julius led a team to the playoffs as their best player. I can't say Jeremy Grant can lead a team That's as fair. their best player to the playoffs. That's I just fair. think the Knicks fans are so off of Julius. And, you know, maybe the pressure of playing in New York is immense. And maybe his style is not something that Knicks fans like visually. Yeah. But I think the NBA team can kind of use it. It's like, this is this is a good player, but we know how much the fans don't like him, and we know how yeah. much you guys are in this position where you kind of have to move him to keep peace. Let's lowball him. But I, I do think Julius Randle is a better player yeah. than yeah, yeah. Well, Jeremy Grant. Yeah let, me, let, yeah, let me rephrase that. He is a better player than Grant, but I think Grant is a better defender. This, that's what I'm saying overall fit. I think Grant is a better defender, a guy that can guard multiple positions, and for a Portland team, I think that's more of a of an area of need. You're a Portland fan. You tell me if I'm wrong, but I think Grant is a better defender than Randall. Randall overall, offensively, way better in terms of uh, in terms of shot creation and all that. The, the Jeremy Grant, I'll, I'll give you all that. But I think Grant is a better defender than him. Yeah, yeah, I, I could definitely see that. I mean, but you know, we need Julius shooting the three ball like he shot in. 2021 that's it that's <laughs> so right. i think that's probably the biggest difference between the julius that everybody loved and then the one last year when the three ball wasn't falling and i mean there's some other other factors to it but I, I agree with your point there al jump in before we uh move on to the next role no i think you guys covered it all i mean i would like to see i mean 
Rafael, it sounds like you really do want Julius Randle on the Blazers right now. So if you really want to, you know, you can talk to your people, make sure you make that happen. I mean, it's all we, good. We'll, we'll Eric, be happy. We'll, we'll give you Eric Bledsoe and uh <laughs> Oh my God, Eric Bledsoe. <laughs> Woo. Oh, <laughs> give you man. Eric Bledsoe. And I think the Blazers have like a $20 million, um, was it a trade exception? How about that? Hmm. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> we know you want to get rid of him we're, we're trying to lowball you alright back to the phones we go a couple more before we wrap we got uh, two 917s let me go 917-209 she name and where you tapping in from yeah big draft it's Let's a big go. draft homie Let's from go. Florida Rafi what's good Alex CP what's, what's going good? on what up what up yo um I, I, I want to talk about. I want to go. I want to talk about a kid that nobody talks about, and I want to pick Jaden Hardy. To me, either if we stay at eleven, it's either Jaden Hardy or Eason is the pick. So I want to talk about him first. I want you to give us some hope, Rafi. Let us know if the Knicks could trade up to the fourth pick and grab Jaden Ivy. I want the front office to do something spectacular. This front office has been boring me the whole three years. Like, they never going to be – is the front office ever going to do something that's going to change the game for the Knicks? So, let us know if you think they could possibly trade up the four. But I want to talk about Hardy um, as the 11th pick, and I want to talk about that kid from Memphis, Josh Minot. I've been hearing a lot mm-hmm. about that Josh Minot kid. What you think, Rafi? What you think? Give, give, me, give me a lowdown. <laughs> Appreciate the call, bro. <laughs> yeah, I, I, Hardy was someone that coming into the season, people thought he was going to be a lottery pick. Mm. There was even some rumblings that he could be as good as Jalen Green. And the the big, I guess the big skill set that everyone wanted to see was if he could play the point guard. If he showed the ability to play the point guard, because he's a shot creator. He, he can get his own shot. That's one thing for sure. He's definitely a bucket. But he wasn't efficient at all. He really struggled with his efficiency. And he did not really get the opportunity to be the primary ball handler because of the emergence of Dyson Daniels. So, um, you know, a team could get him and he could end up being a, a steal, um, but he does have something that teams covet is a guy that can create his own shot. And he's an advanced shot creator for, for his age. And um, I, I think honestly, Shaden Sharp's camp looked at what happened with Hardy and was like, Hey, our stock is high enough right now. We shutting it down. Because Hardy really lost some money in a sense. I mean, he, he he gained money by playing the Indy Ignite, but he lost money as far as draft position by um, not being efficient from the floor. And then now, you know, I mean, everybody thought he was a lock to be the first Ignite player taken, and now he's he's going to be second, could possibly fall to third behind behind Marjan Beauchamp. But I mean, I like the potential there because, like I said, he can create his own shot, he can score. Um, and then I was uh, Josh Minot. Mm-hmm. I actually spoke to one of his coaches, and he it was a a, a former coach, and and of course coaches can be a little bit biased, mm-hmm. but he said that he thinks that Minot is Michael Bridges 2.0 mm-hmm. without the jumper. But as far as like his ability to defend multiple positions, the athleticism, the length, and he just felt like if he can just develop a catch and shoot jumper and the team is patient with him, he could have a Michael Bridges type impact on the team. So uh, he he's definitely worth the risk at 42. If the Knicks are interested in like developing, if they, you know, if their developmental program is all about being patient and allowing him to be brought along slowly until he, you know, develops a reliable jumper. But right now he's like a wing like he has the body type of a wing, mm-hmm. but he has like this blue collar game, like a, a four. I mean, most of his points are going to come from offensive rebound, tips, crashing the glass, kind of scoring at the dunker spot. He's definitely blue collar, not afraid to mix it up. And I, I think Knicks fans would like that. I mean, Knicks fans like guys that, that bring a lot of effort and energy, but he's still a little raw. Last That's call. Then. Sure. Oh, you, no, you, you I just, got it. Got it. Jump in. No, I just got one question about Hardy because mm-hmm. you said they want to. See, you, you said scouts want to see if he could play the point guard, right? Yeah. Is that, is that is that saying that he's too small to be playing a shooting guard? No, he's I just think that he he was like a, you know, everyone knows that he can score, but I think the way today's NBA is, if you're like going to be a 
big time scorer, then you have to have some playmaking ability, you know, when teams double. So everyone likes, you know, think about your top scorers in the NBA. They're all pretty good passers, whether it's Luca, whether it's Trey Young, whether it's, uh, you know, um, you know, just there's not, I guess today's NBA is not for guys that can just only score and they can't really get others involved. And so that was one of the things scouts wanted to see if he could be like, you know, a, a lead ball handler as opposed to strictly a two. Can he run pick and rolls? Can he make reads? Or is he just a guy that can just fill it up and get buckets? And so he didn't really get the opportunity to show that because Dyson Daniels emerged. And then um, they had Pooh Jetter, who's like one of the veterans on the team that's supposed to, you know, kind of lead the way. So, um, and, uh, but yeah, I mean, if he can show that, which, I mean, I guess you really can't show it in workouts in a sense, but if, if he can show that in the league, then, I mean, I think the sky's the limit for him. Last call of the night, 917-386. What's your name? Where are you tapping in from? Yo, what's good? It's JJ from Brooklyn. JJ what's going on? from Brooklyn, the closer of what the up? night. What's good, my guy? <laughs> what's good, my dude? Yo, CP, congrats, Yo. man. Thanks, I'm, just, I'm really proud of you, bro. That's amazing. Nobody deserves that more than you, man. Appreciate Nobody. It. Appreciate All it. the hard work you put in, man. You've always been humble and just really happy for you, bro. Thanks a lot, Really bro. happy for you, De- man. Definitely appreciate no it. No doubt, no doubt. Mm-hmm. No doubt. Raphael, man, and honestly, you're my hero. When you said Mark Williams got 11 for the Knicks, I was grinning, man. That's who I want. That's who I've been wanting. I know Knicks fans probably don't don't want a center at 11. I get it. They, you know, I see a lot of people say you can get a cheap center in free agency that could give you blocks, you know, or you can sign one for cheap. But this guy's an elite, elite rim protector. You know, he's, this guy is just everything that Tibbs would want. I would let Mitch go. This guy, he's shown – that he could uh he could shoot free throws. He shot over seventy percent from the free throw line. He's got a yep. post game. He's shown that he could post up a little bit. I think he's a guy who could end up being a solid mid range shooter. Mm-hmm. It's just rim protection is just it's unbelievable. It's awesome. So we know how much Tibbs loves that, right? So if someone's gonna play, it's gonna be somebody like that as a rookie for Tibbs, you know what I'm saying? So but I just have a question that I'll hang up is um with with the draft being before free agency. How do you kind of go about with the, what's going on with Mitch and possibly drafting a center if they want to go that route when, you know, you hope they'll have some the, the inside information which way, you know, how the direction is going mm-hmm. with them and Mitch and free agency-wise. But if they don't know for sure, how would you go about that? And do you think that's something that NBA should change? Because I'm not a fan of that, of having uh, the draft before free agency. So, but, yeah, that's it. Thanks so much, man. You guys stick you guys take care. Take right? care, bro. Thanks for the Thank call. You. Yeah, man. I, I love Thanks, this man. question because it just kind of shows what goes on behind the scenes in the NBA. Think about it. Like every year, they're like free agency starts at midnight, and then at twelve oh two, whoa, just like just Everything. signed a five yeah. year. You're like rapid so, fire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so clearly, negotiations are done prior to yeah. midnight. Yeah. And in the Knicks case, I mean, Mitchell's their own guy. So they could say, look, here's our offer. They can make it today. And if he says yay, then maybe they don't make the move. If he says no, then now the gamble is on him because he has to wait and see if another team makes an offer. But, I mean, I think the NBA knows no matter how much they try to stop it, they know yeah. they know negotiations are going on prior I mean, like, I'm even thinking, like, at the Combine, every decision maker is there. And you can't tell me guys aren't talking about, you know, (laughs) Mm -hmm. they're like, well, we can't talk about this right now because we're going to get behind. So, um, yeah, but I I do think, like, you know, in in this case, if it's their own guy, they can say, look, this is our number. If you come with something better, you know, more more power to you. But this is what we're offering. But, yeah, I, I would like to see free agency before the draft, I think it would help teams out a little bit. Yeah, me too. And, and, uh, but honestly, I mean, this is kind of off the subject. I would love to see the end of the draft. I would love to see rookies enter the NBA as free agents. Now teams can't be bad. Like you have to, I mean, you have to do it the same way you do free agents. You have Mm -hmm. to sell people on coming. I don't, I mean, that would end tanking in a sense. I mean, now there's just a reward 
for, okay, we're going to be bad. Well, we don't like our players. All right, let's going to be bad. And I don't like what the Thunder are doing. I get it. It makes sense. The league rewards it. But Gilgis Alexander keeps playing like 60 games here. Then in, you know, Horford basically had a whole red shirt season last year yeah, because yeah. the Thunder um, didn't want to play him. So anyway, that's that's a whole different subject. But no, to answer your question, I, I do think that Mitch will probably know where the Knicks stand on his contract before free agency. That's a good, good point. And uh, we talked about Mark Williams. We talked about Mitch. But there's a guy, man, who's who's killing uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, the social media right now. Um, his hive, he might have the biggest hive in the history of hives ever. ever. And and it's getting it's getting serious out here. His name is Kai Soto, man. What is up with Kai Soto? Shout out to the guy that sent us a super chat on on this topic. I'm gonna get to your name in just a second. Uh, but Kai Soto, man, what, what's what is the the hype about Kai Soto and, and what's going on with him? I mean, his fan base is I, I call it the Soto Army, and they're aggressive. Yeah, <laughs> and they're deep. <laughs> And so uh, I've had my run-ins with them because, uh, you know, like when I would do a video breakdown on international prospects, if I didn't make one on him, Mm -hmm. they would flood my YouTube mentions, question my credibility as a scout (laughs) and accuse me of multiple things. And I get it. You know, he is coming from a basketball crazed country. They love basketball. Philippines loves hoops. Shout out to everybody um, in the Philippines, man. And I mean, just Asia, period. I lived in China multiple times. And, you know, you can go to a basketball court in China at 6 a.m. and it's packed. I mean, their basketball courts, not like, you know, in the States where you may have two courts and four rims. They may have like eight courts. And I mean, they're packed. And I mean, they just love basketball there. So him being like the the official face of, of a whole country I think there is a lot of added pressure on him mm. and the fans just want to see him succeed. I've had, actually had the chance to watch him play in person. And I, I, I think he's good. I mean, I don't think he's an NBA prospect. I mean, no, I should say that. I think he's an NBA prospect. I don't think he's an NBA player. Mm. Um, he definitely has the skill. I just think there's so much pressure on him. Even when he, when I saw him at basketball without borders, this was in 2020, he had a, a camera crew, not even from the Philippines, but a camera crew from China following him around. Like there's so much pressure on him to make it. Mm-hmm. My biggest fear for him is, I mean, he's going to be able to play basketball professionally. He's going to be able to make money. My biggest fear for him is a G league team uses him as mm-hmm. a money maker. Mm-hmm. Right. So I've seen it with the, it happened a few years ago where the Mavericks drafted a kid from India Mm-hmm. You know, India has a billion people that mm-hmm. live there. Mm-hmm. They drafted him, no intentions of ever having him play for the Mavericks. The goal, the the reason was to put him on Marketing. the Texas Legend, which is their G League team. Now you get sponsorships in India. Now, you know, even if it's like 0.5 of a percent of the billions of people there, that's more eyes than you're getting in the States. I mean, you can sell jerseys. It's so many, and G League teams don't, really profit they don't make money so there are some teams that may look at it as like all right this is a kid we can say we're developing him but we know he's gonna get he's gonna generate a lot of buzz and a lot of revenue and then you know he may feel like you know i'm not really here for basketball i'm here for marketing purposes Mm. and i've seen it happen so Mm. that's like my biggest fear for him i'd much rather see him go somewhere where he can actually play as opposed to being like a you know, a a a a money maker for marketing reasons. What well, what what would be his biggest challenge? Uh, you know, skills wise in terms of making it at the next level. Um. Well, he's a center, so he does have skills. He can shoot the ball a little bit, but from what I the, when I saw him play, he wasn't like you know your rim protector. You know, like you know in the NBA. When you're looking for a center, you're looking for, I mean, he can block shots. I mean, he's not like your vertical lob threat. Mm-hmm. He's not like your dominant physical low post player. And he can space the floor, but he's not like your guy that you can say, All right, this is your job to be a pick and pop five. Mm-hmm. So while he does have skills, I don't know if he has a specific skill set to hang his hat on to be an NBA player. And then I think, and this, and I don't want to sound, 
how can I say this without sounding, I'm going to get accused of being racist anyway. But one thing about like the Asian community is they have, uh, it's, how can I say this? It may not be in their DNA to like dominate opponents, right? You know how like in America, we want to rip your heart out. You're across the, mm. the there's a niceness to his game. Like he does mm -hmm. show flashes, but there is a, you know, a, a niceness to where he, you know, you may question like, all right, if you're not going to be, you know, I don't know. Does he have that dog, dog in him? Dog, yeah, yeah. And so I think like Yao had it. It was a quiet, but he had this, you know, he had it. Yi Jiliang, the, the kid mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, a few years later, mm -hmm. that he is an NBA player. Yeah, he, he cool. is he, he was so nice. talented. Like I spent time in China. He could shoot the three, mm -hmm. but he struggles when he doesn't have any physical advantages. Like over there in China, he has advantages. But now when everybody is athletic or a little bit more athletic, then he has to have something extra that he brings to the table. And so I think like with, with Kai Soto, I think that, again, he has skills. I just don't know if he has that dog in him to where, you know, somebody's being extra physical. He's going to fight back. Copy, copy. But I can say that about American players also. Um, but I, I think he's a very nice, respectful kid. And sometimes he plays like a very nice, respectful kid. I think that's probably the best way to put it. All right. Well, we'll see. We'll see what happens with the kid, man. But great show. Uh, I think we 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 covered off our basis, man. It was definitely a great show. Let me hit the outro music here. Al, great show. Um, Raphael, we got to do this again, man. Hopefully, after the draft, we'll come back and uh, get your draft grade for the New York Knicks, number eleven pick, number forty-two. Will they trade up? Will they trade back? Let's see what happens, man. What's uh what's on the horizon for you? In between now and uh, and the draft, yeah, just uh, draft stuff. Plan on putting out a, a lot of content and uh, just really maximizing this opportunity that um, Chad Ford had blessed me with with taking over his um, his newsletter and his podcast. And so, uh, for people that subscribe, I just saw I got a subscription from Knicks Fan TV. Shout out to you! I really really appreciate that. I appreciate all the you know people that have subscribed and. I kind of got big shoes to fill, you know, because Chad is, you know, he's kind of like the pioneer in this whole draft space. So there's a little pressure behind that. But, um, yeah, just putting out the best content that I can. And um, I'm actually ready for this draft cycle to be over. I feel like I've been watching the same guys yeah. and talking about them since August. And I'm kind of ready to move on to 2023 because it's a different set of, I mean, I just love finding new players that I really didn't know about. Nah, that's dope, man. O only the beginning for you. And uh, uh, just drop you your Twitter handles and everything where, where they can find you. Yeah, you can find me at Barlow, B A R L O W E 500. That's my Twitter. Um, NBABigBoard.com. That is the newsletter. It's a it's a subscription based newsletter, um, but there is some free content. And um, But it's $50 for the year, $7 a month. Yeah. And then um, there's the Locked On NBA Big Board podcast, which is now five days a week. So um, I'm, I'm hosting five days there. So easy to find. I try to interact with as many people as I can on on uh, on uh, Twitter and social media. I love to talk draft. And I mean, yeah. you, you'll get some stuff that's non draft related to for me from time to time. Hey, subscribe to the big board, man. We 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 don't we don't have no shame about it. Subscribe to the big board. It's premium content. This man is bleeding the draft. He's traveling all across the world. Every continent. He's been on every continent scouting NBA prospects. This is the information you don't get anywhere else, people. Point blank, period. And that's why it is premium content. Support this man. Support his journey. The, it, it, it's only getting started, man. Very happy for you, bro. Thanks again for uh, dropping these gems on us. We definitely appreciate it. We need it. And uh, we'll see you again after the draft. Uh, Thank Terry, you so much, man. I really appreciate it, man. Absolutely. To everybody at home, remember that this show is presented by Manscaped. If you guys enjoy this show, uh, number one, hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell, share these videos, and uh, support our sponsors. Go to manscaped.com, promo code KFTV for 20% off plus free shipping. Remember that uh, KFTV, the new era snaps, are in stores, people. The 
Inventory is dwindling, people. So if you haven't gotten your snap yet for the summer, make sure you place your order because with all these shipping supply uh, shortages, I'm not sure when we're going to get a re-up. So make sure you, that you get your snaps now before the start of next season. And remember that this show is available in audio podcast format, man. All the major podcast platforms. So uh, if you miss it on video, you can always catch it on audio, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all the major ones, man. We are everywhere no need to miss it and uh yeah man great show um al real quick uh, what you think about game two last night man game two nba finals golden state celtics i have no good read on this on this series whatsoever that's why i think it's still gonna go seven both yeah. these teams seven yeah, it's gonna go seven I, I like honestly watching game one warriors came out strong and then celtics came back Game two, Celtics came out strong. Warriors came back. I don't know, man. There's just yeah. too much going on. But last night, you see why I have the I have the Warriors winning this in seven because Celtics, when you have those type of turnovers and shot selection, ain't gonna cut it against a team that sees like the Warriors. Yeah, the the turnover battle was was crazy, man. Turnover battle was it, it was it flipped night and day from game one and two. You know, game one, Warriors it gave up. Uh, 24 points off of 14 turnovers. Game two, Celtics gave up 33 points off of 19 turnovers. But this game really went the way I expected it to. I thought Warriors are going to go out and blitz them. I thought the referees are going to give them the benefit of the doubt. They had Draymond out there playing football, not basketball. He was getting away with everything. And, and it went the way I expected it to. And look, the chef was the chef. He, he was killing them off the pick and roll. You know, Celtics were in a lot of drop coverage. They were destroying them. Poole found his groove. And uh, I thought that, you know, the early foul woes with Tatum and Brown, the turnovers, Celtics just couldn't get into a groove. But um, I did like how Tatum approached the game. I think he's going to need to stay aggressive because he's just not going to have those nights where you're getting 21 points from Derek White and 26 from Al Horford. Tatum has to be Tatum for the Celtics to have any chance. I still think this is going to go seven. I think it's going to be a good series. I think it's, it's, it's so far it's, it's looked that way. Uh, we'll see how, uh, how game three looks. Uh, Raphael, any, any thoughts on the game? Yeah, I mean, I was your comment about Draymond playing football. Yeah. I mean, I think he punked him. Oh, I, yeah. I think oh, yeah. the, the he he's been Draymond. I mean, yes. that's his role to be an irritant. He's gonna do whatever it takes to win. And um, you know, I it, it's it's funny to see that the referees admitted like we're not gonna yes, eject yes. him yeah. because it is. <laughs> yes. And it, it's almost to the point now where I feel like if he gets a tech he is if it's a close game he can say whatever he oh, can, yeah. and they're they're not going to eject him and one of the comments was the only way he was going to get ejected is if he kicks someone right right <laughs> right so right um you know like his reputation allows him it gets some technicals but it also gives him more leeway to just continue to bark and, and, and just fact. be draymond so it is it, i just like again i just thought it was interesting that they admit it like yes. you know we're not going to eject them. yeah yeah that that was a very interesting part of the game and you're right i thought the celtics folded into his mind games and and i think that threw them off their game whether it was yep. marcus smart grant williams you know jalen brown you know give credit to draymond because that's part of the game too right so uh again interesting series we'll see what happens wednesday but once again fellas great show great show to everybody in the chat and we will catch up with you guys next week for another edition of Next Weekly, man. Hit that thumbs up button for your boy. Share these videos.